If you would, take your Bibles with me this morning. We're going to start in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 18 this morning, starting in verse 9. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9, and going on to verse 14 this morning. It says, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. He said, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pause here for just a moment. You know, this is such a a good parable for the modern church. It really is a powerful one. We see this example. You've got two men in church. You've got two of them. And one of them looks the part He says all the right things. He does the things he's supposed to do. But he's arrogant. And he's puffed up. And he's proud. He sees himself as a rung above all the others. And he prays. And in the corner of the temple, there stands a tax collector. Done nothing right his entire life. He's messed up in every way, shape, and form. And yet, when he calls out to God, he does it in such a way to simply say, I'm not worthy. I know who I am. And God puts these two right there, polar opposites in front of everybody. And He says, now one of these men went down to his house redeemed that day. You see, the thing is is that there's a purpose for the church. There's a purpose. And the purpose for that church is to reach, reach out and save that which is lost to grow one another in spiritual growth, to challenge one another spiritually, scripturally, to become more like Christ each and every day. The Pharisee forgot that. He got to a point where he thought it was about making himself better. It's about God being glorified through His people. And here you've got somebody, a tax collector, who again has done nothing right. He's cheated. He's lied. He's stole. He's done all these things. And yet he says, I want to be forgiven. I want to be forgiven. I want to know God. Boy, that is the gas in the tank for every church body. That's where we just come along and say, brother, we want you to get right with God. And then just wrap around and help them grow in Jesus Christ. That's our calling, is it not? Is to watch each other grow and repent in Jesus Christ. To seek and save that which is lost. That's our purpose. But man, it's easy for, to forget what that purpose is sometimes. It's easy to forget. It's easy to forget in a number of things. When you're raising children, it's easy to forget that you're trying to teach them. It's easy to forget because when you got them screaming and yelling and going nuts all over the house, all you can think of in that moment is, I want quiet. I want quiet. Now, I know this is bad, but I think every parent's done it before. It'll be a nice, beautiful summer day. The kids are out playing. You think, oh, this is great. And what do you do? You lock all the deadbolts in the house. Keep them outside. Flip the deadbolts. I want quiet. The Bible says I'm to teach and raise them. I'll do it later. I need mental peace at the moment. Easy to forget when things get crazy. It's easy to forget that in marriage, we're to be each other's best friend. Not just partner, but our partner's best friend. That requires listening, it requires talking, it requires empathy. Things that don't really come easy every single day. But that's the challenge we're supposed to be when we're in marriage. Now here in church, As this example, this Pharisee was supposed to be an intercessor, a teacher for the people. To challenge them to 
make sacrifices to give alms to God that they may be righteous and forgiven. Here's a man seeking that. And instead what he does is he's more consumed with how good he is than how much this man needs God. And that's a dangerous place to get when we forget our purpose. That's when not only mistakes are made, but that's when things are lost. That's when marriages are lost. That's when friendships are lost. That's when memories are lost. That's when even the connection of father and son or mother and daughter get lost. When we forget that purpose for which we were created and put here. A church becomes ineffective when we lose our desire to seek and save the lost of this world. When we go further in Scripture to Matthew chapter 5, go ahead and turn there with me. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13 and going on to verse 16. It says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they put a light, a, a, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but, the, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I remember one time in a little country church I was pastoring. I went out in the community and I started knocking on doors. Pre-COVID, we did this quite a bit back then. You go around, you knock on doors, you invite people to go to church. I had a fellow with me, he knew the community really well, lived there all of his life. He knocked on the door. He's telling me all about the fellow who's in there. He said, now he's a bit of a character. And I said, well, that's okay. I'm one too. So we knocked on the door. We heard a voice and he said, come on in. Come on in. So we go in the house and there's nobody there. And we're looking around. We said, where are you? He said, oh, I'm in the back. Just go ahead and sit on the couch. Get comfortable. So we do. And here comes a fella out of the back. He's just out of the shower. He hadn't even dressed yet. He's got a towel on. And he just walks right in the front room and plops down. That is an uncomfortable visit, by the way. I told him, I said, we can come back later. This isn't a, a good time. He said, no, 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 you're fine. I love company. Sit down. Let's visit. I trained my eyes on the clock in the back of the room. I'm not going to look at him. I'm looking at the clock in the back. And we're talking. I'm sharing with him the Lord. I'm sharing with him, you know, I, I'd love to see him in church. He tells me, he says, Pastor, I go to church. He said, I go to church every year. I said, really? He said, oh yeah. He said, I go every year. He said, sometimes I go three to four times a year. I'm confused by this point. Not just because of the man's attire, but because of the, uh, the statement. I'm confused. I said, well, I said, you, you, why do you only go three, four times out of the year? He said, well, pastor, he said, I'm what you call a belly Baptist. I said, I have never heard of such a terminology. What is a belly Baptist? He said, when there's food, I come. I said, now that I've heard of. I, I've heard of that one. And I looked at him and I, I said, I said, so you're a Christian is what you're telling me. You're a Christian. He, oh, yeah, I, I accepted the Lord when I was a young man. I said, well, why don't you come when there's not food so you get to know the people better and so you can hear the Gospel and you can grow with us. He looked at me. He said, when you have a dinner, I will come. And all of a sudden, it just kind of hit me. This is exactly what the Scripture's talking about. The man identifies himself as a Christian because he attends church. But he has no desire to serve the Lord. When salt loses its saltiness, when salt loses its desire to be effective in its ministry to the, to the world, we're no longer of use for anything. That's exactly what happened. The man was as, man as friendly a man as I'd ever met in my life. 
But as a Christian, he became completely ineffective. He had lost his desire to do anything worthwhile for the Lord. And the Bible warns us of this. This is a very, very good example of exactly the Pharisee and the tax collector. You have one that doesn't know God that desperately wants to know Him. You have another who has knowledge of God and is content with, the, with, the, with how people see Him and view Him and has no desire to go deeper in the Lord. Now you have God telling His disciples, it's not enough that you just walk with Me. He's letting them know, I'm not always going to be here in the flesh beside you. You have to love Me. You have to love what I love. You have to have a saltiness that goes out and makes the rest of the world thirsty for more of Me. And that's a hard thing to do. You may ask yourself the question, how do I make myself, to put in the in pastor's vernacular, how do I make myself salty? You start being different than the rest of the world. You don't do the things the rest of the world does. You separate yourself from that. And you start living for Christ because it's something that they don't understand and it's going to make them curious as to what you have that they no longer possess. And they're going to say, what is different about you? And you can share with them Jesus Christ. But before you get to that point, you have to start separating yourself from the things of the world. The approach of the world. You have to start separating yourself from that. You say, Pastor, how do I, do I just say no to the bad things? No! I'm talking about a difference of character as much as I am separating yourself from the sinful things of the world. It means loving people who are not lovable. That's a hard one. But it'll make you salty. You've got to start loving the people that nobody else is able to love. You have to start forgiving your enemies and wishing good for them. Because this is what Jesus taught. Again, not an easy thing to do, but it will make you different from the rest of the world. You've got to start changing things about your character in order to honor God. That is not an easy thing to do. And honestly, it's an impossible thing for man to do. But if you're pursuing God, it will happen. You can't just do as the Pharisees do and change the outside. You can't just say, look at me. I go to church whenever it's open. Uh, I'm, I'm dressing as a church member dresses. Uh, my, 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 my actions when I go to church, I'm, I'm a part of everything they do. Hogwash. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about changing character. Going from what you used to be apart from God to a new person in God. And in that, making you somebody that the world will recognize and want to be like. That's what you're looking at happening in the story between the Pharisee and the tax collector. The tax collector is calling out to God saying, I want to be different. The Pharisee's not doing that. He's saying, I'm pretty good the way I am. The tax collector is saying, I want to be different. I'm not happy with who I am. He wants to be changed. Church, where is our desire to be changed in Jesus Christ? Because you can tell me right now, you can say, I'm doing much better, Pastor, than I used to be. If you knew me back when, boy, you'd recognize how good I am now. If you're satisfied with who you are today, then you're not where you're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. Because our pursuit of God is a relentless pursuit. It's a daily pursuit. I should not be satisfied with where I am today. I should want to go deeper in Christ than where I was yesterday. I should want to be more like Him every single day that I, that I have breath in my lungs. I'm not happy with who I am right now. I want to be like Jesus. And that's that saltiness that the Scripture is talking about. As a matter of fact, if you turn your Bibles over to John chapter 4, we're introduced to a woman... She's a Samaritan woman. She's not lived a great life. As a matter of fact, she's what we would call extremely promiscuous back in the day. She was someone that the town people gossiped about. Here Jesus goes into a Samaritan village. He goes to a well. He's tired. He's thirsty. This is in the middle of the day. The hottest part of the day. And here this woman comes to get water out of the well. Now church, to give you just a little bit of background to the story... Women back at this time did not go get water in the heat of the day. 
It wasn't smart. You went early in the day, right at the crack of dawn, because it was cooler, it was refreshing. All the women of the town would be gathered there. You could catch up on all the news. It's just how things worked back then. This woman waited till it was the hottest part of the day because she wanted to avoid the gossips in the town. Because she was the source of all their gossip. Her life, the way she lived, the choices she made, that was the gossip, the talk of the town. And she was avoiding everybody. But when she goes there, she meets Jesus. And they start having a conversation with each other. And Jesus tells her, He says, if you knew the water that I offered, you would never thirst again. This intrigued her. She wanted to know, what water are you talking about? How do I get this water? He starts sharing with her who he is. And she says, and he tells her, he says, why don't you go home and get your husband? Tell your husband. She tells him, I have no husband. This is all in that chapter I give you. You can read it. We're going to jump in there in a minute. She says, I don't have a husband. Jesus responds to her, you say correctly because you've had four. You've had four. We're talking ancient times, not modern times, ancient times. This was a scandal and a half. And Jesus knew all about it. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. They were supposed to hate each other anyway. And now Jesus knows everything wrong she's ever done on top of this. And He's still talking to her about salvation. Now she runs and she starts telling everybody about this conversation. And when we pick up in the story in John chapter 4, starting, starting in verse 27, this is, is what we read. In John chapter 4, verse 27, it says, And at this point, His disciples came and they marveled that He talked with a woman, yet no one said, What do you seek? Why are you talking to her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Now listen to the excitement right there in that statement. This woman is hated by the Jews. She's speaking to a Jew. She's done everything wrong in her life. She's not done anything right. She's the source of all the town's gossip. And here Jesus shares with her salvation. Doesn't tell her everything she did was okay. Doesn't tell her that, oh, you're beautiful. You don't need to change. He doesn't do that. He shares with her the message of salvation. And because of that, she leaves her water pot. She doesn't even take what she came there to get. And she runs back to town. She tells everybody, this man told me Every evil thing I've ever done in my life, I think He could be the Messiah. Woo! She got something better than water that day because if somebody told me everything I ever did wrong, I'd be looking at them and saying, are you Facebook stalking me? I'd be like, what is going on with you? You don't seem right to me. You're touched in the head. I don't like you. Oh, there was something different about this conversation. Because at this point in the conversation, this woman says, this man, this man is special. He could be the Messiah. That tells me there was something so salty about the way that Jesus spoke to this woman in a good way that she desired more of Him. And even though He was telling her, you're not right with me, she was saying, i got to go back to Him. There's more here. There's more here. i got to go back, and i got to bring people with me. She's going back in the town telling them, say, you got to go talk to this Jesus. He knows everything about me, and He still talked to me. He's a Jew. He's my enemy, and He loves me. you got to go talk to this man. And the, the disciples just sit back and watch and learn. This is amazing. This is, this is absolutely enrapturing to them. They can't take their eyes off of it. And this is the example the church is to follow. Now, is that not exciting to you and me? Because, buddy, it fires me up. This is, the ex this is the example that we're to follow. That there should be such a saltiness about us as Christian believers that it should draw the whole world in. Not because of how great we are. Because I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm a flawed person. 
just as every single one of you are too. We're all flawed people. You don't have to look hard to find fault with anybody in the room. You could find it really, really quick. But the world should be able to look at us and see so much Jesus inside of us that the world says, man, i got to go find out what's going on. I haven't seen this anywhere else before. They should be standing back saying, I just went to Walmart. This place is a lot different than Walmart. you got to go come see what this is about. And see, if you're not chuckling, you missed that joke because that was pretty good in my opinion. There's something different here. There's something different. And I want to know what it is. This woman wanted to know what it is. And when you go on down to verse 39 of this same chapter, it says, And many, many of the Samaritans of the city believed him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Let's stop there for just a moment. We're going to get into more, but I want to pause here for just a moment because look at verse 39. Verse 39 is so amazing. Many people were led to Christ because of the word of this woman. And what was the word? He told me everything I ever did. And he still talked to me. How many of us would still be talking to each other if we knew everything that the other did? If you knew every single thing that the person sitting next to you ever did, would you ever speak to them again? I'll answer for you, no. No, you would not. Would you ever go to church again if you knew what every Christian believer was thinking or doing throughout the course of the week? Would you ever enter to a church again? I will answer that. No, you would not. That's what's so incredible about this story. Because this woman said, He knows me. He knows me. He knows all about my marriages. He knows what I've said. He knows what I've done. He knows the lifestyle I live. He knows the gossip that's said about me. He knows everything about me. And gentlemen, He never got out of His seat to leave me. He never pushed me away. He still told me I needed to be saved. And I am amazed at this man. And that's Jesus for you and me. That's Jesus for you and me. He knows everything we ever did. And He's still here. He's still here. See, the world wants to take that message and they want to twist it a little bit. They want to tell you that Jesus loves you unconditionally no matter what you do. That's true. Except He's not going to give you permission to stay in that. He's not going to tell you just keep on going. It's all okay. He's not going to break His Word and tell you that everything is permissible. But if you want Him, He will never leave. The tax collector wanted Him. The tax collector was a thief, was a liar. He oppressed his own people. He put many people even in poverty and in prison. And when he called out to God, he was still there. The woman, the Samaritan woman, she wrecked marriages. She did many unspeakable things that wouldn't be fitting to talk about even in church. But she wanted him. And he was there. And she went out and she told all the other Samaritans, you've got to go talk to Jesus. You've got to go talk to Him. And when they arrived and they spoke to Jesus, by the words of Christ, they believed. By the words of Christ, they believed. The very last verse, verse 42, it says, Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this indeed, the Christ, the Savior of the world. What she said, what the woman said, got them there. 
it got them to approach Jesus. But it wasn't by her word that they were saved. It was by the words of Jesus Himself that made all the difference. You see, I agree with my brother, my brother John. When he prayed earlier, he mentioned that all we hear on the news is doomsday, doomsday. That's what we hear. But as a Christian, I'm not looking for doomsday. I'm looking for redemption day. I'm looking for the day that Christ redeems His people and takes us home. And because of that, I want everyone to know about Jesus. I don't want them to be left to see what happens. I want them to have the same redemption day that I am looking forward to. But to do that, I can't speak just words. My character has to change so that people can see the saltiness in me and be attracted to the Savior, much like the Samaritan woman. Or I run out into town and say, you got to talk to Jesus. you got to talk to Jesus. you got to go find Jesus. And because they see that I'm different, that my character has changed, because the Spirit of God rests inside of me, they say, I need to go see for myself who this Jesus is. Because, buddy, I'm telling you, when they start talking to Jesus, things are going to start changing. Things are going to start changing. Lives are going to start changing. And you're going to see the world turned upside down because they spent time with Jesus. Because they spent time with Jesus. It was never about a church. It was never about a denomination. Oh, it's about Jesus. When we get up to heaven someday, whoo! What a revival that will be. Because I'm going to see about every Christian denomination who professes the name of Jesus Christ and believes in Him. I'm going to see them dancing at the throne of Jesus Christ. I'm going to see every knee bow. I'm going to hear every tongue confess the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to see the Samaritan woman dancing before the throne of God Almighty saying, He told me every wrong thing I ever did and I found my redemption day. I'm going to see the tax collector standing in the corner of the temple only now he's going to be standing right square in front of the throne of Jesus dancing saying, He heard my prayer and I've made it home. It's not about the church. It's about Jesus. And when we finally get a hold of that truth, things are going to start changing. People's lives will be changed. Hope will be reborn once again. Things will be turned upside down in a good way when we start accepting that it's about Jesus Christ once again. I'm telling you what, you turn on the news, you hear all the politicians say the different things. I'm going to tell you right now, every single one of them, Democrat, Republican, Independent, every one of them will bow a knee to Jesus Christ. Every single tongue will confess His name. Every single one of them will be held to account. My mission in this life is to preach the name of Jesus though, so that every person without hope can find hope so that every Samaritan woman who thinks she's too far gone can find her way back home to Jesus. So that every tax collector who's oppressed others and wants to be forgiven can find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. It is not about looking good. It's about being changed. And today you have an opportunity. Those watching have an opportunity to be changed by the hand of Jesus Christ today. Music can start making your way forward this morning. Church, we serve a mighty God. He is the same yesterday, He's the same today, and He'll be the same forevermore. He does not change. But we see the world changing all around us. We have to be careful as Christian believers not to move off of the foundation on which we were planted. We were planted on the foundation of the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ. And today we are called to be different. We cannot be the same that we were yesterday. We cannot do it. My greatest fear in all the Scriptures, my greatest fear from my church, my greatest fear from myself, is that we will reach a point where we will become similar to the Pharisee. 
speaking one thing and yet doing another. Trying to look good, trying to look the part, but being absolutely nowhere even remotely close to what we're called to be. That's why I love that story so much. Because in the tax collector, I see exactly who I'm called to be. A repentant man. Repentant. Where I fall on my face before God. And I say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the wrong that I see and I know is there. I'm sorry for the evil that I don't even know that it's there anymore, but I know I'm a flawed man. And saying, Lord Jesus, I need You. I need You. I need You with my last breath. Father, I need You. Where will we turn on that day? On that day when the Lord calls our name, that we gasp for our last breath, Where will I be? I won't be able to call the church prayer line. I won't be able to reach out and ask somebody for help. In that moment, it remains only me and my God. That is it. There's no one else. I came into this world alone. I will leave this world alone. There is no spouse to cling to. There is no child to grab onto. There's no pastor that can pull me out of that depth. There's nothing that I can grab. It is only me. Just me and my Savior. And in that moment, you have to ask, am I ready? Am I ready? Have I been the tax collector to call out to God and ask Him to forgive me of my sins? Am I the Samaritan woman where He knows all the evil I've done and I've asked Him for forgiveness? Or am I like the Pharisee clinging on to a look that I want others to see but still retaining the nastiness of that sin in my heart? I pray for each and every Christian believer that we can lay down the evil in our lives so that when we take our last breath, we enter eternity with confidence to know that I belong to Jesus. I've met a lot of good people. Not all of them have been ready. Not all of them have been ready. What a sad day. What a sad day for many believers. When they when they approach that final time and they say, yeah, I went to church occasionally. I served God when it was convenient. I would go and worship when there was food. And then to take their last breath and to see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to utterly miss eternity. To utterly miss it. To know the truth and turn away. I can't think of anything more painful than that. I can't think of anything more painful. Can you? To look at the hands of Christ and see the nail prints that you heard about in Sunday school look at his feet and see the prints the nail prints to look at his side the crown of thorns where it was placed on his head and blood rushed down his face for God to look at us in that day and say I don't know you I don't know you depart from me turn around just walk away for all eternity never to see him again church far be it from anyone in this room to ever face such a moment today God is calling today is calling you know he's calling you can feel it you know he's calling it's time we stop playing these church games it's time we stop trying to look the part and actually finally become that part, that Christian that we are called to be different from the rest of the world, laying down our pride and picking up the righteousness of God. So today, I urge you as fellow believers, grow in Jesus. Grow in Jesus. Have a character that shines forth with the brightness of God. And finish the mission that we were sent here to complete. Finish the mission win souls for the kingdom of God. Whatever need you have, 
whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart this morning, I invite you to this altar. It's open for any need. Please come.